Amen. Amen. He thought I was worth saving. He thought I was worth dying for. Amen. We just praise God because he thought that we were, we were valuable enough to send his son, Jesus Christ, to save us. Even when we were yet in sin, Jesus died so that we could be saved. And we praise him today because he thought we were worthy enough for him to die for. Amen. Amen. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we come before you this morning just giving you praise, Father God, for another opportunity to worship, another opportunity to open up the sacred writ, Father God, and to bring a word in your name. Right now, Father God, we just ask that you just clear our hearts and minds and spirits so that we can receive the divine revelation that only the Holy Spirit can give us. Open up our minds, hearts, Lord, so that we can hear from you, Father God, so that a word would be said that will touch us even on the inner recesses of our hearts and in our souls. So Father God, I make myself available to you right now, Father God, to think with my mind, speak with my mouth, use my entire body and being so that your name would be glorified. Someone might be edified. Someone might come running saying, what must I do to be saved? And so now, Father God, let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our individual and collective hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, for indeed you are our strength and our redeemer. We ask it all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Today, I would like to refer you to the Gospel of St. Luke. And for your prayerful consideration, I would like to lift up Luke, the seventh chapter, verses 11 through 17. You have your Bible. Please feel free to turn and read along with us. And otherwise, the, uh, the verses will be put on the screen, I believe. Luke, the seventh chapter, verses 11 through 17. Amen. If you have it, just say amen. Amen. Luke, the seventh chapter, verses 11 through 17. And the word of God reads, and it came to pass the day after that he went into a city called Nain. And many of his disciples went with him and much people. Now, when he came nigh to the gate of the city, Behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And much people of the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said unto her, weep not. And he came and touched the buyer, and they that bare him stood still. And he said, young man, I say unto thee, arise. And he that was dead set up and began to speak. And he delivered him to his mother. And there came a fear on all, and they glorified God, saying that a great prophet is risen up among us, and that God has visited his people. And this rumor of him went forth throughout all Judea and throughout all the region round about. Amen. Amen. I'd like to focus in on verses 16 and 17, and I'm, I'd like to read it from the message translation. It reads, they all realized they were in a place of holy mystery, that God was at work among them. They were quietly worshipful and then noisily grateful, calling out among themselves, God is back looking to the needs of his people. The news of Jesus spread all throughout the country. This morning for your perfect consideration, I'd like to preach from the subject, when Jesus comes to town. When Jesus comes to town. This month, more than a billion people will celebrate Christmas. 
amid candlelights, carols, and the smells of cedar and incense, the old story will unfold again. Gabriel's visitation, the journey to Bethlehem, the arrival of the baby in a manger, the glorious announcement to the shepherds in the night, the star in the east, the arrival of the Magi. Oh, we know the story well. But my question for us today is, even though we know the story well, have we lost its true meaning? We have so deluded Christmas with our worldly traditions and customs that now December 25th has little, if anything, to do with the advent or coming of Jesus Christ into the world. The world tells us not even to say Merry Christmas anymore. We're supposed to say Happy Holidays or Merry Xmas. But as Christians, we must understand that the letter X symbolizes the unknown. And so by saying Merry Xmas, we are affirming that who, it, that, that, that who and what we are celebrating is really unknown. And so we can accept the worldly view that Chris, Christmas is not a Christian holiday, but a day to decorate trees and to help the economy by, by spending a lot of money on presents. Mm. But I submit to you today that the point of Christmas and the advent of God into this world and the person of Jesus Christ is not about decorating trees and putting up lights and going into debt buying gifts we cannot afford for people who really don't need it. No, Christmas is about remembering when Jesus comes to town. And when Jesus comes to town, things change. When Jesus comes to town, our priorities get re reordered. When Jesus comes to town, our lives get turned upside down. When Jesus comes to town, what was dead lives again. Jesus summed up his mission in John 10:10. 10, 10. The thief cometh no, but not to, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I am come that they might have life and that they might have life more abundantly. We live in a world of depression, despair, loneliness, and death. But when Jesus comes to town, he brings life and life more abundantly. So let the world celebrate Santa Claus and Frosty the Snowman and Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. But as for me and my house, we will give God praise because Jesus came to town. Somebody say hallelujah. You see, the reason that Jesus entered into this world in the first place is Jesus cares. And it gives me great strength to know that with all that is going on around us, all that's going on in our homes, in our churches, in our communities, in our state, in our country, all over the world. We get pandemic, we got wars and rumors of wars. We've got political unrest. We've got people marching in the street. We've got kids killing kids. But in the midst of all of that, it gives me great strength to know that Jesus still cares. Is there anybody listening to me today that knows that Jesus still cares? That's right. Amen. Amen. When you look at all that you've been through, when you look at where you've been, when you look at how people have treated you, when you look at how people are treating you right now, when you look at the evil words that some people have said about you, all you have to do is remember that Jesus cares. Even if my mother and my father forsake me, Jesus still cares. And what I like about the Lord is no matter where I may be, no matter what I may be going through in my life, no matter what condition I may be in, the Lord will show up. Somebody say, when Jesus comes to town. Consider this text. Now, unlike the Gospels of Mark and Matthew, which were written primarily to Jewish believers still living in the Holy Land, Luke's gospel was written primarily to Hellenized Jews. These were Jews living in the greater Greco-Roman world who had uh, accepted Greek and Roman lifestyles, and, 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 but they were still yet believers in Yahweh, in, in Elohim, in the one true and mighty God. So Mark is addressing 
I mean, Luke is addressing his gospel to these Hellenized Jews and also to Gentiles who had accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And the text tells us that after a short stay in Capernaum, where he heals a centurion servant, Jesus travels to a town called Nain. Now, the word name literally means lovely. Name was located a couple of days' walk from Capernaum, and we are told that accompanying Jesus was his disciples and a very large crowd. Jesus had developed quite a following of people because they had seen him perform miracles, and they were completely amazed by this. This crowd with Jesus was buzzing with excitement. They were wondering what this miracle worker would do next. They were jubilant. They were full of life. They were happy. They, they had anticipation and hope. They were really loving life. In effect, they were living life and life more abundantly. But as this bustling crowd approaches the gate of name, they collide with another crowd coming out of the city, which is completely different. This second crowd was a part of a funeral procession. They were crying, wailing, moaning, and grieving. We are told that the son of a widow had died. Now, I, I've been to a lot of funerals. I've conducted funerals. And while all funerals are sad, I believe that there are some funerals that are more tragic than others. Often when an elderly person dies, we are thankful for their long life and we miss them. But we are also a little happy that their struggle with old age and sickness and suffering has ended and they've gone on to a better place. But when a young person dies, sometimes it's hard to accept. The death of a young person seems very unfair. We read here that a mother is burying her son. And when a parent has to bury their child, this is especially sad. For a parent doesn't expect to outlive his or her own children. And while we don't know how old exactly this dead boy was, we can assume that he wasn't very old. For in verse 14, it, Jesus refers to the dead boy as a young man. Now, the Greek word there for young man is neaniskos, and it, it literally means a youth. So, this means that the dead boy was very young. But what that also means is that the widow was not very old herself. Her son was too young to be married. We don't have a mention of a wife or children in the text, just his mother. And so there was great sadness associated with this funeral. And it is likely that nearly the whole town was in this funeral procession to grieve and support this widow. But to add to the sadness, the text lets us know that the mother was a widow and that this was her only son. Now she would be left alone for the rest of her life. She had already buried her husband some time ago, and now she's burying her only son. So, so there wasn't a very bright future ahead of her. In the first century, there was no welfare system. There was no uh, housing assistance or public housing. There was no public uh, 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 medical insurance or anything like that. And it wasn't very easy for a woman to earn a living. Women were by and large dependent upon the males in the family for their support. This woman didn't have any more men in her family. And so she faced a life of short-term misery due to the funeral and the death of her only son. But she also faced long-term misery, trying to survive without companionship, without financial support, without any males to help take care of her. And she would have to live the rest of her life in this condition until the day came when they would be carrying her out of the city to be buried in the same cemetery that her husband and her only son were buried in. This was the situation. This was a dire situation. It was a miserable situation because of the loss of one so young and also because of the predicament that 
the widow was in. Now, this was what was on the minds of the members of the second crowd as they came out of this city and collided with Jesus and the first crowd at the city gate. These two crowds couldn't be more different. The crowd coming in had just witnessed a great healing. The crowd going out had just witnessed a tragic death. The crowd coming in the city was very excited. The crowd going out of the city was devastated. The crowd coming in the city was very happy. They were laughing, they were smiling and having a good time. The crowd going out was sad. They were crying and mourning. The crowd coming in the city was longing for the future. The crowd going out was fearing the future. The one leading the crowd coming into the city had huge potential. The one leading the crowd going out of the city had no potential. The one leading the crowd coming into the city had great power. The one leading the crowd going out of the city had no power. Two very different crowds. But my question is, which crowd are you in today? Some of you, with in, even in the midst of all the things that are going on in the world, all the trials and tribulations you have experienced, you remain positive and upbeat about life. Some of us are feeling as though our hearts have been ripped out and we're ready to quit. Which crowd are you in today? Two very different crowds and they collide at the city gate. And when they collide, death is confronted by life. Verse 13 says that Jesus looked and he saw this grieving widow and his heart went out to her. He had compassion for her. And he said to her, weep not. Or in other words, don't cry. Nothing had to be said to Jesus to show him that this woman was hurting. Jesus saw her pain. Nothing had to be explained to Jesus about what, what happened. Jesus knew her circumstances. Jesus saw her. Somebody ought to praise God that the Lord sees us. But he didn't just see what was going on on the outside of her. He saw what was happening on the inside of her. Lord Jesus. That's why you should never be jealous of other people because you don't know what's going on with them. There are some people who look okay in their lives on the outside, but inside is just turmoil, sadness, and, 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 and just, just suffering. It doesn't matter what you got on the outside. I mean, you can take like a, uh, the, the, the singer Prince, for instance, uh, world famous, made a lot of money, very rich, but he died alone in an elevator. Mm. Sad, lonely. Mm. And I'm so glad that we have a savior who doesn't just look on the outside of us, but he looks at what's going on and cares about what's going on on the inside of us. And because he cares about me, he tells me, don't cry, for I am with you, even in the midst of what you're going through. You know, often when we are in the midst of pain and suffering, we don't think that God understands. But the Bible lets us know that he does understand. Jesus understood what this woman was feeling. He knew her deepest fears. He saw the pain and the loneliness that she was enduring. The 55th Psalm captures this. David is experiencing fear and depression and suffering due to what's going on all around him. And he says in verse 14 in the New International Version, he says, but I call to God and the Lord saves me. Evening, morning, and noon, I cry out in distress. And he hears my voice. He ransoms me unharmed from, from the battle waged against me, even though many oppose me. 
cast your cares on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous fall, but you, O oh God, will bring down the wicked into the pit of corruption. Bloodthirsty and deceitful men will not live out half their days. But as for me, I trust in you. And we can trust in Jesus because he sees what we are feeling and he will act to help us even before we ask. This woman didn't have to ask for help. Jesus offered help out of his compassion for her. And he helps us out of his compassion for us also. He tells the woman, don't cry. Don't cry. Now, if, if I had been there, I would have said, Jesus, come on now. This woman's husband is dead. They're on the way to the graveyard to bury her only son. And all you can do is say, don't cry. Mm -hmm. I saw you do all these miracles. I've seen you do all this great stuff. I've, I've heard you preach. I've heard you teach. You always have something profound to say. You, the father, are one. And all you got to say to this grieving widow is, don't cry. Mm -hmm. But understand what Jesus is really telling this woman is there's no need for you to cry yeah. because I have come to town. Yeah, right. yeah. Sometimes we have to learn to stop worrying and crying over situations and just let Jesus work it out. That's right. Have you ever been worrying and crying over a situation and Jesus had already worked it out? Have you ever felt like you were going to die? due to the pain of some bad experience. But then one day you, you, you had new hope and you didn't even know when you started feeling better. Mm -hmm. Is there anybody listening to me today who knows that while we are sitting around trying to figure it out, the Lord has already worked it out? That's right. That's right. And I think it's very interesting here that Jesus didn't try to understand the circumstances behind this death before giving this mother compassion. He didn't ask any questions to demonstrate to the crowd that this woman deserved compassion. I mean, we don't, we don't know why the boy died. Did he die due to an illness? Was there violence? Did he, did he commit suicide? Was there an accident? We, we don't know. Was he a member of a gang? Was he a drug dealer? Maybe he was executed as a criminal. We don't know the answer, and Jesus didn't even ask these questions. Jesus didn't ask if the boy belonged to church or not. Jesus didn't ask if the boy was a Republican or a Democrat. Jesus didn't ask if the boy was black or white. Jesus didn't ask if the boy was straight or gay. He just offered compassion to someone who was hurt. And that's the model for us also. We shouldn't try to figure out who is really hurting and who deserves our sympathy. If someone is hurting, we should give them love and let them know we care about them and try to help them. Why? Because love is given out of God's grace. And none of us really deserve it. You don't deserve God's grace. I don't deserve it. The woman didn't deserve it. But Jesus gives love to all of us through the grace of God. You don't have to buy it. You don't have to work for it. He gives his love unconditionally. And Jesus came to town to teach us to love unconditionally. By saying, don't cry, he offered this widow comfort and hope. Now, psychologists tell us that tears are needed for emotional healing. They're a good thing. But Jesus tells this woman not to cry because he's about to remove the need for emotional healing. He's about to remove the cause of the tears. He's about to make this woman whole. He's not going to just show sympathy or pretend to care. He's going to act and show compassion. See, Jesus is not like some of us. You know, when people come to us and, and they're in need and they're in hurt, and we'll say, oh, I'm going to pray for you. I'm praying for you. Or we put on Facebook the little hand, uh, you know, praying hands emoji. I'm praying, I'm praying. And we don't bit more pray for them. 
when we're praying, we we asking God for a new car and a new house and a new boyfriend or girlfriend. We don't remember them. But Jesus is not like that. Jesus not only shows compassion, Jesus not only cares, but Jesus acts. So my question is, where are you today? Are you hurting in pain? If so, I want to reassure you that Jesus knows what you are feeling. He has sympathy for you, but also he wants to help you and do something practical and show you compassion. He wants to help you through your painful times by giving you hope and by showing you his unconditional love. And Jesus' actions are authoritative. He has the authority to do it. This dead boy was lying in a buyer. And, and a buyer is, is just a wooden frame. It looks like a coffin, but it doesn't have a lid on it. They would have had him lying in the thing and they would have bound his ankles together so that his legs wouldn't flop off. His arms would have been crossed over his chest. They may have had a shawl over his face. Sometimes they may have a canopy with freshly, uh, freshly cut palm branches woven together. It was a, a buyer was 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 like a large wicker basket. And as Jesus approached the coffin, everything grew quiet. No one except the men would have touched the buyer because to do so would result in ritual uncleanliness. And because Jesus was a rabbi under the law, he especially was prohibited from touching dead things. But Jesus reached out and touched the buyer anyway. <laughs> Jesus wasn't afraid of defilement. Jesus wasn't afraid of men considering him to be unclean. His action was authoritative. You see, God created the law to lead us to grace. But often in church, so sadly, so unfortunately, we church people use the law to prohibit people we don't like from coming to Jesus, from coming to church, and experiencing God's grace. Lord, I think sometimes some church folk think that they're like a bouncer at a club. You know, they got the rope line there, and then they get to decide, okay, you're in, you're out, you're in, you're out. <laughs> but when Jesus comes to town, he says, let, so, let whosoever will come unto me. That's right. So don't ever think that you are too dirty. Don't ever think that what you did was too bad. Just don't, don't, don't ever think that, okay, first I have to get myself together and then I'm gonna come to church, then I'll come to Jesus. Let me tell you something, if you could get yourself together, you'd be together by now. And Jesus comes to town to let us know that no matter how far we have fallen, no matter how dirty we've become, you are never too dirty for him to touch you. Now look at what happened when he touched the buyer. The word says that, that, that the men who were bearing the buyer came to a halt. Now, now I want you to picture this. They're moving forward with this, with this buyer, this coffin, if, if you will, on their shoulders. The pallbearers are carrying the coffin to the graveyard. There's a crowd of people grieving and moaning and crying behind them. Jesus is coming toward them and everybody stops. Jesus just stops them in their tracks. You see, when Jesus reaches out and touches us, no matter what pain we're going through, that pain goes no further. And I don't know if you've ever had a touch from Jesus, but I have. I've had troubles in my life that have kept me from going forward. Mm. But when Jesus saw my trouble, he reached out and touched them and, and, and they stopped right where they are. Mm. See, we pray for a lot of different things, but all we really need is a touch from Jesus. Is there anybody listening today who's ever had a touch from the Lord? Is there anybody listening to me who, 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 who know that, that the Lord stops some stuff from going forward? Uh, is there anybody listening to me who is like me? 
You praise God not only for what happened, but you also praise God for what didn't happen. Or you know it could have been you mm -hmm. with HIV. Watch out. You know it could have been you who got shot that night in the club. Mm -hmm. You know it could have been you who was living in the street. Back home, we used to sing, we used to sing, uh, 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 Lord, I could have been dead, sleeping in my grave. You made Odell back up, Lord, you made him behave, because you've been good. Been good. You've been mighty nice. Been good. You've been good. You've been mighty nice. I know you've been so good to me. And Jesus comes to town so that we can learn to say, if it had not been for the Lord who was on my side, That's right. oh, where yeah. would I be? Jesus says to the young man, I say to you, get up. And the dead boy sat up, sat up and began to talk. The two crowds collided. Death uh, collided with life and death lost out. Mm. And Jesus comes to town to show us that the life he offers is enough to defeat the death that the world offers because he has authority from God. Mm -hmm. That's why he was able to say to Martha, who had just lost her brother Lazarus, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whosoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Mm -hmm. Now, that's John 11, 25 through 26. Amen. So, now, I, 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 I'm going to wind this up. But before I finish, understand, and I'm sure you already know this, but if you don't, understand that anytime you study Holy Scripture, Scripture has a twofold meaning. There's the immediate, immediate contextual meaning, 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 this is the story and this is what happens. But there is also a universal spiritual meaning. And when we look at this story of Jesus raising this dead boy in the city of Nain, we have to understand the spiritual meaning. See, in this story, the city of Nain represents the world. Which is very ironic because, as I told you earlier, Nain literally means lovely. Now, as I also said earlier, we do not know what the boy died from, but we do know that he died in the world. And in the world, what may appear to be lovely may in fact be dead. Mm. Remember a few years ago when, 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 when golfer Tiger Woods got in trouble? Oh, I'm sure those young women he met were very lovely to Tiger Woods when he met them. But after his wife had left, his children and his family were mad at him. His golf career was in shambles. I bet those young women and his affairs with them seemed deadly. How many people right now who are dying from lung cancer and AIDS and are strung out on alcohol and crack and heroin they, they, they got that way because at first it seemed lovely, but it turned out to be deadly. Sexual sin, lying, stealing, greed, pride, the list goes on and on. Most sins and most of the situations that we get ourselves in start out because they appear lovely. But in the end, if it's not of God, it turns out to be deadly. So understand that Nain represents the world. And the boy has died in the world because the king of the world, the devil, Lucifer, the enemy, comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And if there's anybody listening to me today who's still in the world, you may not be physically dead, but you are dead in your sin. You are spiritually dead because you serve the king of this world. But the good news is there's another king coming to town. Mm. <laughs> and as the crowd brings this dead boy out of the world, they meet the crowd with Jesus, the king of kings, who's coming to town. And Jesus has compassion. Jesus loves us even when we are dead in our sins. Jesus loves us even when we are serving the enemy, the king of this world. Mm. 
The truth is, I love the Lord because he first loved me. Because when Jesus comes to town, there is healing. That's With true. the world, there is death. When Jesus comes to town, there is excitement. With the world, there is devastation. When Jesus comes to town, there is joy. With the world, there is sadness. When Jesus comes to town, there is a longing for the future. With the world, there is fear of the future. When Jesus comes to town, there is huge potential. With the world, there is no potential. When Jesus comes to town, there is great power. With the world, there is no power. And when Jesus comes to town, you will never be lonely again. <laughs> For he will never leave you nor forsake you. Who shall, who, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Mm -hmm. But nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Now, we got to go, but there's just one more thing, and then I'm, I'm, I'm going to sit down. The Bible says in verse 15 that the dead boy sat up and he began to speak mm -hmm. and Jesus gave him back to his mother. Mm -hmm. And then both of the crowds were filled with amazement and they began to glorify the Lord saying, God is back. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh Lord, right there somebody should shout, mm -hmm. God is back. Mm -hmm. And he is looking to the needs of his people. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I believe that every time we see the Lord move in somebody's life, every time the Lord moves in our own lives, we ought to glorify the Lord. When the Lord brings me out of a crisis, I should give him praise. When the Lord brings me over a mountain, I just have to tell somebody. When the Lord heals my body, I just can't keep it to myself. I said I wasn't going to tell anybody, but I just can't keep it to myself. And these people saw how bad the situation was. And the Bible said that they started glorifying God and praising him for what Jesus had done. And when Jesus comes to town, you can't keep your mouth closed. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And so as I close, I want to know, is there anybody listening to me today who knows that when Jesus comes to town, he brings life? and he brings life more abundant. When Jesus comes to town, he will wipe away the tears from your eyes. When Jesus comes to town, he cares about you, even when you don't care about yourself. Can somebody listening testify that you've been through the storm and rain, through heartaches and pain, but you found out that through it all, you have a savior who cares so much that he will come right where you are and touch you so don't throw in the towel, don't give up because Jesus came to town so that I could say, Father, I stretch my hands to thee. No other help I know. Because when Jesus comes to town, he will become the center of your joy. Jesus, you're the center of my joy. All this good and perfect comes from you. You're the heart of my contentment, hope for all I do. Jesus, you're the center of my joy. Amen. 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 Let's give God praise. Amen for his word. Amen. Let's give God praise because Jesus came to town. Let's give God praise that Jesus touched you and saved you and gave you hope and a future 
and Jesus kept you from the enemy. Jesus kept you from that situation. Jesus kept you from dying. Jesus kept you because of his grace, because the Lord is not finished with you yet. You, I don't care if you 98 years old, the, if you still breathing, if you can still hear me today, the Lord is not finished with you yet. So keep pressing, keep moving forward. Don't just lie there and die. Get up and begin talking like that dead boy. Glorify the Lord Glorify. for all that he has done. Amen. 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 Father, we just thank you today. We just thank you, Father God, because Jesus came to town. We just thank you, Father God, that Jesus came to save a wretch like me. And we also thank you, Father God, that Jesus died so that I could be free and that I could have right relationship with you. And so, Father God, we just thank you and we praise your holy name. Let this word accomplish the purpose for which you have ordained. You ordained before the foundation of the world was laid. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If there's anybody listening to me today, 